with that, I again thank you so very much for being here, for choosing us as your ticketing partner, something I said we're aware you don't have to do, uh, something that we have to earn and continue to earn it every day. And thank you for your support for coming here and joining in this, this first ticket forum with us. So with that, I'm going to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Troy Kirby. I could, I could stand here for the next hour and talk about all the stuff that he's done and how he's made a name for himself in the, in the sports industry. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I have this sneaking feeling that he can do it better than I can. So without further ado, I thank you and I give you Mr. Kirby. You know, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Danielle and Leroy. Would you guys mind applauding them? What, what they're planning on doing here is really exciting. When they emailed me probably about, what was it, about August, July about doing this, it was, well, what are you really trying to do? Is it going to be an insurance seminar? Are we just going to kind of learn how great ticket return is because we've already invested in it? Or are we going to learn how to gain revenue? And to be honest with you, I wouldn't have been a part of it if it hadn't been the latter of the two. Because realistically, you know, gaining revenue is a huge, really at the forefront of what we need to do in this entire industry. You know, I feel that, you know, Ticket Forum is really a great opportunity to learn. I mean, it's more engagement with the product. And, of course, if we're not gaining revenue, what's the point? But here's the problem. You guys are all early adopters, and it's really scary right now because in this industry, we're never an early adopter, are we? We're, we're always replicate and duplicate. That's, that's how we copy things, whether it be promotions or other activities. We always want to do what somebody else did. And it's really hard to be somebody that actually innovates and says, wow, okay, I'm gonna try this for the first time, no matter what, you know? There's always gonna be naysayers out there. There's always a chance to go into something unproven, but rarely do we, and I think that this is a great opportunity to maximize, and as well as make some people jealous that didn't actually sign up for this thing after they hear how much you're gonna get out of it. So, you know, I, I kinda liken it back to the podcast itself. I, uh, some of you may not know, I do a podcast, uh, interviewed about 300 sports executives. And when I was thinking about doing it, the reason why was that I kept getting people that were young executives who said, well, we just give away free tickets. That's how we get more people in. Or, you know, we, we just, we don't have to do those things. I want to get my foot in the door. I don't want to actually, I don't want to have to sell. Uh, we don't have to sell. All of those misconceptions really bothered me. And I think that when you talk to people that are actually in our industry and actually had to live through it, the last thing they want is people that don't feel you have to sell. Or, you know, one of my favorites was uh, when I was hiring for an assistant ticket manager position is, well, why do you want to work in sports? Well, I feel it'll be a best way for me to express myself. <laughs> Nobody cares. You know, I, mean, I mean, that's great. You want to express yourself, but uh, I don't know that we necessarily need the, uh, the paid spectator who wants to sit on the sidelines. We, we want the actual person that wants to engage in our product, wants to be able to sell it, convey a great you know, environment and entertainment. And when I started the podcast, I had some people go, oh, this is gonna ruin you. It's gonna, you know, the industry does, nobody does this, so you just gotta be careful. And what's funny is that same person a year and a half later was begging to be on. So I, I count that as like, you know, good blessings. Now I've kind of converted them over, so eventually. But I think you just have to recognize, in general, innovation is something that really means you're understanding that you're taking chances. Not everything you do is gonna work out. But if you learn from that, I think that you change really how you view things, how you change it for the next time that you're doing something, and really you're building your business acumen. You know, sports business on this side of it, nobody talks about that. When I got my master's degree at Seattle University, and it was uh, really one of the first times that they'd ever had it where they had instructors who'd actually worked in the field. We had Bob Witsit, who had worked uh, at the Trailblazers. He'd worked at the Seahawks. He'd done various things. He said he was the only man to be fired twice for winning executive of the year. I thought that was, you know, I mean, that's good stuff to know. But after a while, you get the impression that 
kids don't want to hear that because they want to hear what somebody else will tell them, which is you just break in and then you can go into the marketing. You don't have to sell. You don't have to do anything. And realistically, if you think along those lines, you're not going to survive in this industry. So what I'd collectively like to say is we need to stop saying that we want to break into the industry if we're young. We want to say, how do we stay into this industry? And part of that is realizing you have to increase your business acumen and learn how revenue analytics works. You know, Ticket Forum, I think the reason that this exists beyond all other, you know, there's tons of conferences out there that you could go to. But if it's not just growing your revenue, it's also about ensuring your customer loyalty. You know, frankly, if you're not building redemptions and your tickets sold, you're not doing anything. And that's one thing that I think we always talk about the numbers. How many tickets did you sell last night? How many, what, what do your numbers look like? But we never talk about the no-shows that show up because, you know, that's how they show up. We see them in the number afterwards. We're like, wow, why are those seats empty? I thought those seats were sold. And it's really disturbing that we focus so much on making sure that we could fill the seats by giving out tickets or you know heavily discounted tickets but never seeing if they actually show up and pay into our per cap <clears throat> and that's a key point here is redemption there's nothing else i say that matters to you because you probably blanked out or you're tired from the breakfast you had redemption matters <laughs> if you don't actually if you don't have them come it doesn't matter what you do and they have to be spending because that's the only way they value not only the product but the per caps you're actually doing and it's realistically not getting them to redeem means they're not going to buy a second time. You know, we can get people to buy once anything. I mean, I can go and, you know, sell something on something and give them whatever image I want. But if they don't show up to it, that means they found something better to do. That means something else preoccupied their time. And the next time that happens and you try to sell them again, they're going to open that drawer full of tickets that were unused. And I'm sure you guys get that, especially with season tickets, and ask, well, what's, what's the value to me? I, I didn't even use it. And I think that that matters because it comes down to relationships. You know, when you're looking at customer relationships, it's really how you get ticket redemption. And I can't stress that enough because I think sometimes we look at the relationship as a transactional one or the buying a ticket. It's got to be more than that. We've got to really care about what our customers do and really how they kind of interact. You know, I'm going to say, well, StubHub exists and they can get a lower price somewhere else. StubHub shows you exactly why relationships matter because StubHub only uses the fact that they have a discount measure. If StubHub didn't have the discount measure, nobody would go to them at all. There's no reason to. But they have a discount and you haven't provided them a relationship in general and that's where the that's where the rubber meets the road as far as whether or not you're going to retain and get your clients to want to be a part of you over a stub hub over a discount over a gold star you know but it really means creating a relationship you know that's number one with your clients and whether or not you kind of look at it as well geez you know I've got I've got so many people I've, I've got so little time you know in this industry we've got to make time because if we're not we're really failing not only ourselves, but our customers. And how do we build that customer you know, relationship? Well, it's just common stuff, you know, trust, value, respect on both sides. And that means they respect your price point. That means if you're going out and you're distributing free tickets, you are not doing yourselves any favors. You are instantly telling them, why would I buy your product? You don't believe in it. I mean, if you look at uh, somebody who sits and buys your product, they invest in your product, they're buying long term. And now you have sitting next to them some yokel who you gave a free ticket to so they could try the experience. How much you want to bet they're going to tell that long term buyer how much of a sucker they are because they actually paid for something that they could have gotten for free? I mean, frankly, if you look at it, you're, you're challenging yourself by doing that. And that's not helping. The heavily discounted stuff, uh, Major League Baseball, you know, is about to start in a few months. And um, Gold Star, I always look at their stuff. And a Major League Baseball team that's close to me um, actually had a Gold Star thing. Entire month of April. Now, this is their first month that they're going to be out. Entire month of April, field box seats. These are the great seats. Half off. And I look at that. And then so I go over to the regular site. 
and I see that their dynamic ticket price is like double that. Well, so why would I invest in your product if I'm getting your best month against some of your best rivals and you're already undercutting me you know, through another secondary site? And people don't see it that way because people don't think people research. But if you're doing that, you're not really respecting your customer, which comes back to the relationship because your customer will go to the quickest uh, distance between two points. And honestly, the internet exists. So if people want to look and make it as a price discount, that's where they're going to do it. But realistically, I, I look at it as, you know, we talk about whether or not things have changed at all. I still think there are some people that view it like the 1970s. There's nothing else going on. We're the only baseball team in town. But, you know, we're still living by this big announcement. Ask yourself this. How many big announcements have you had in your email today? How many times have you been sent something via Twitter, via Facebook, everything else? There are tons of big announcements. You cannot, you cannot tell me that big announcements matter anymore because you see so many of them. I mean, we're inundated with so much news. So by definition, uh, relying on the big announcement that's somehow going to draw people like it did in the 70s when we had, you know, three stations when they showed tape-delayed games, so you had to do the live experience. And that's why roller derby was popular. You know, roller, these, these types of events that no longer exist don't exist anymore, because, you know, or they're kind of a niche sport because of the fact that, guess what? There's tons of stuff to do. You have the equivalent of 10 times what they had on the space shuttle that went to the moon in your phone. You have the power to look at any type of entertainment streaming live, any type of content. I could watch the Super Bowl without actually having to look for a TV. Frankly, uh, underestimating your client base by, by deciding that your big announcement is going to be what drives them, not going to work. You know, but I think that competition relies everywhere. Uh, I went across the street here last night with the Liberty guys, and we actually went to a bowling alley. And I don't know if it struck them, but we weren't in a bowling alley. I was in an entertainment center. There was a giant electronic ticker of every single sports score. There was wall to wall, every single sporting event you could ever want. It was not just restaurant, not just bar. Bowling was kind of secondary. Frankly, if you're looking at the entertainment options that are around you, you have a lot of challenges. And if you're going to suggest that somehow a bowling alley is a bowling alley anymore, go across the street. It looks completely different. And those are the challenges that when you're selling to your customers, you have to kind of realize and say, I've got to embrace for. How do we get them in and how do we get them invested in our product long term when there's so many entertainment options out there? That means increasing the amount of entertainment and the amount of relationship you have with them. But realistically, with Ticket Origins, you got to kind of realize that nobody actually grew up looking at this side of the business and wanting to be in it. I mean, I don't know about you. Does any kid grow up saying, I want to be a ticket manager? I don't think so. <laughs> you know, because tickets aren't glamorous. I mean, nobody gets results. You know, they get results, but nobody looks at them and says, wow, okay, that's what I want to aspire to. Everyone says marketing or something else. And I think I believed in a lot of those misconceptions when I was you know, growing up because I didn't know any better. And it's a lot different when you actually look on the other side of the, you know, plane. Uh, we did our budgets once at a school I was at uh, because we were tired of alumni who were, uh, they were on this board and the board gave $100 each a year. And they, felt, they said, well, we support the program and, you know, we do this and there's 10 people. So I was like, well, okay, so you really don't. Let's see our budget. And afterwards we had two or three of the guys go, why did the school even support us? You know, like, wh why does that even matter? I think it's the reality con uh, compared to the misconception of exactly what's going on, you know? But, you know, frankly, I was more involved in the journalism side when I was young, because that's where I thought sports was, you know, that's how you do it. Um, I actually have a weird story about that because of the fact that, you know, when I got into it, I, I only thought of it from the standpoint that when you covered a thing, that's what made people come out, that's what made people drive forward. But, you know, frankly, you know, you can do all that and still have no one show up. You know, that, that's the problem with it is we're, we're still living under the idea that everybody's paying attention to no matter what we do. 
when realistically you have to keep telling people and inundating people and getting them to buy early. Otherwise, they're not going to be a part of it. You know, my uh, first job really in sports came from the Spokane Shadow as a PR director. And I showed up and I thought, oh, this is great. I'm going to write some stories. It's going to drive people out. The first day I get there, I was handed a phone and a call list. It's like, wait, these are media? No, this is, you, you also sell tickets here. It's kind of interesting, you know, I never would have thought that, you know. Why am I selling tickets? It's not job description. No, that's not how that works. Uh, Bobby Brett uh, owns them. He's George Brett's brother, but he's the more successful Brett as far as I'm concerned in the minor league side. But um, frankly, you know, then it was the next day it was washing down seats. Well, that's not my job description. No, that's what you're going to do. The next day it's washing out the concession stands. And you don't realize until after you get into minor league sports exactly how much work you do that is beyond a job description. And that if you don't do that job, it really comes down to the customer experience and how little they're going to embrace your product because they expect things done. When everyone shows up to anything, when you guys have shown up here, you expect certain things done, regardless of whether or not you know, there's enough people to handle it or whatever. They have to be done. That means we're all jacks of all trades or jills of all trades. I don't want to you know, sound like I'm being slightful, but, you know, frankly, it's those little things, you know, but you, there are some very cool things that get to happen. You know, we had a, uh, our GM there that, you know, gave me one of the best experiences for how to handle your anger. He uh, got mad after our rival opposing team uh, won the game on our home field. And he waited till they were in the locker room and they were celebrating and they celebrated too loud and he pulled the fire alarm so that they all got drenched. And, you know, it's some, some people handle their anger better than others, you know. <laughs> but it re realistically, getting back to it, it's about sales. It's about understanding who the customer is, really knowing their wants, needs, and desires, and really making, you know, that focus on how better their experience can be. You know, and I think that that's that customer-first mentality. We all have to have it. That means we're not here without the customer that means there's no fun if nobody shows up. And realistically, we're part of the fun department. But I think that, you know, one of my first jobs at Seattle U kind of, you know, braced me for how weird sports can get. Um, I showed up at Seattle U, and I was going to be the GA of sports information. And, you know, I had gone into the program, and, you know, I was showing up March 26, 2006. And if you remember why, I can remember the date. It's because how packful this became. Um, frankly, I showed up and the SID sat me down and said, well, I'm leaving. You're leaving. Yeah, uh, my, this is my last day, but Wendy got through the AD. will be there tomorrow. Don't worry. You know, you can come back tomorrow and she'll, be, she'll have everything taken care of. I show up, uh, you know, to my dorm room, type in my email because we didn't have mobile at that time. And all of a sudden you see an email that says, Wendy Guthrie resigns. That's not good. So you know, I show up the next day kind of panicked going, oh, wow. So I find the assistant athletic director and I go, are you staying through the transition? Yeah. Who are you? It's the way things work. So sometimes you don't know whether or not you're going to actually have a job, but you just got to show up anyway. So I just kept showing up and I figured that they just kind of kept me on as either guilt or, you know, I kept annoying them. But at the same time... <laughs> um, but in the SID office, you know, I, w I was there. We had, you know, an interim SID who came in, and he had to handle the fact he had an annoying GA. You know, I mean, you know, not everyone works out, you know, the same way they are. But, you know, I stayed with it, and I got it done. And then I didn't complain, you know. I just kept doing the work. But I saw a lot of people who didn't. They washed out really quick because of the fact that they thought it was something that it's not. And realistically, you either are prepared for this business or you're not. And I think that, that that's kind of like a hallmark of what we all do is there's a lot of great things that people could do. You could enjoy your Saturday nights. You could enjoy your Thursday nights, your Wednesday nights, must-see TV. But instead, you guys decide to provide it towards other people. You, you don't have to work as many hours as you want, you know, but you have to work as many hours as you need, frankly. And, you know, the only time I ever had, you know, any kind of argument with the SID was when he'd pay, uh, play Bill Belichick. And those interviews just graded me because the guy is so monotone. 
But, you know, frankly, you learn a lot of things from people that are around. You know, like the AD there was uh, Bill Hogan, and he was really a mentor to me, and he taught me how to treat people and interact. He taught me to pick up the tab. Please don't practice that right now. But, uh, you know, frankly, about how to embrace realistically getting to know people and understanding what matters and really getting dis not getting distracted with minor issues. But the challenge at CLU is the fact that nobody wanted to answer the phone. And here I'm the SID's graduate assistant. I'm not supposed to worry about this. But I did. So I said, well, you know, give me a phone and I'll, I'll make the calls. I'll, I'll sell something. And they were like, well, it's $200 for a phone, so we can't do that. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll put the $200 forward. And if you don't actually make the $200, you can keep it. Well, that, that seemed a little bold, but they let it go. And, you know, frankly, I, I not only got the phone, but I increased sales. But it wasn't hard to increase sales because they didn't have a lot of sales then. You know, they were a D2. But the, the point was, was that I was willing to accept the fact of trying to be an innovator. I don't know if I am, but, you know, I, I'm trying. I'm doing something more. And really, it's understanding that people don't always see the future like you do. So it's just about doing something anyway to annoy your critics, which, you know, if I, if I can make people upset, you know, at the fact that I'm doing more, that's kind of, you know, it kind of helps in itself. But, you know, it made me look at tickets a new way. You know, I, I really think you understand what it takes to do the things that you do. When you're on the outside, as I mentioned, you don't really see all of the warts. You don't see the things that don't work. You don't see the customer complaints. You don't see the people that say they're going to buy tickets that don't. Instead, you see the people that kind of say they're going to, you know, they give lip service to it, and then they always wonder how they can get something free, you know. But it allows you to get as much info as possible on your field if you're willing to look. But it's really limited out there, which is why, you know, I when I did the podcast, I kind of went back to those days and kind of thought, you know, there really isn't a lot of information of people talking that it's not just me talking. But it's John Spolster talking, or it's Rob Cornelis, who's an innovator in this field. But realistically, a lot of people have kind of forgotten what Gameface did because they went around and trained a lot of executives on how to be better at ticket sales. Because ticket sales, again, was that unglamorous side that nobody wanted to be a part of. But it also made me decide how much I hated free tickets. So, you know, I think that was a good thing. But when I had shown up at uh, Seattle U, one of the first basketball games I experienced was their last of the year. They had 17 people up for their D2 game in attendance. I mean, think about that for a minute. 17 people. That means that even their parents didn't show up. <laughs> their parents found better things to do than show up at their kid's last basketball game. So, you know, we look at that, and it's like, how do you fix that? Instead of going after sports fans, we found anybody that came to campus for any other reason. I don't care if you went to the crab feed. I don't care if you happen to go by, you know, do you just walk through the campus every day? We were going to sell to you. And everyone said, well, you're not focusing on the sports fans. But the point is, just focusing on the sports fans when you're not winning or you're not the higher echelon, that's not going to work. You know, minor league baseball sells 43 million tickets a year. There's a reason. I don't know that a lot of the fans really care about the score on the scoreboard. They care about whether or not they had fun. And, you know, I could be wrong on that, but I really think that I've, I've got something there that, you know, frankly, we have people that, you know, they're, they're way too focused on what we can't control. And that's not going to help us either. So when you're finding new customers and you're avoiding those sports fans, You've got to build the environment for the experience that doesn't focus on wins and losses. And that means coming to terms with the fact that the ultimate fan is probably likely, I'm going to guess, 10 to 15% of your crowd. I don't know. How many of those people actually show up to every single thing? There are some people that do. You know, uh, at one of the universities I worked at, uh, we kept holding alumni uh, fundraisers for our athletic events. And we noticed that essentially we were basically creating reunions between two people that would come to everything. You know, so I don't know that some of those things were actually helpful because the people that decided whether or not we should do those functions happened to be those two people. So if it's not helping, you've got to change up and you've got to fix and you've got to do whatever you can in order to make it better 
not only for the environment, but also cultivation of actual customers. But I always look at how we can do creative things with no money, because if you ever talk to a bean counter who's somehow an executive VP that never sold and somehow got into the business because they got a CPA, they always say, limit the budget, do more with less. Well, you know, you just have to be creative with what you've got. Um, we actually got creative at Seattle University with a uh, chicken wing promotion. I never would have guessed it, never would have thought it was anything. But she had the lady that uh, came to us had like, you know, thousand bucks to spend. It's D2, okay. Well, we've got these gift certificates and we've got all these 100 rubber chickens. Okay, so what do we do with this? So we spent 50 bucks on the um, spray paint to paint them red because that's our colors. And then uh, we threw them out with the coupon stuff down their throat while playing the chicken dance. Didn't think much of it. Okay, you know, some kids, whatever. Then I go by the dorms one time and I see that on the windows of one of the dorms there's lined up, this guy has it upside down, all the chickens. That impacted him enough to actually display them and think that they were funny and I'm sure he beat some small children for it, you know, because of course people act like maniacs as they get older and, you know, <laughs> I've, I've never seen so many people fight out during $8 baseball in my life as when it goes foul, you know, it's like you'll see a human, you'll see adults act like inhuman when they can go after a child to get a baseball before they can get it. But, you know, frankly, it comes down to the idea of are your promotions created enough? Are you selling enough? Or are you just giving away free tickets? Are you giving away heavily discounted tickets? And I find them horrible. So I'm going to reiterate it again because, you know, that's what I'm up here for. But I think that really if you're a free ticket advocate, well, you've never tried to sell them. Because once you've sold them, the last thing you want to do is give them away for free. Because it devalues your marketplace. It creates that battle per for perception. And it doesn't help because even when you do that, I don't think that people show up even when it's free because of anything else that might cost them. Well, they might have to pay for parking. They might have to pay for concessions. They might have to pay for something else. So essentially, they just want your product for free and they're more than happy to allow you to devalue it. And the second you don't, they don't really respect you for it. But anyway, so we went, keep in mind, it was 17 people. We actually got it to 1,700 people on our last game two years later. This is our arch rival. So we had, you know, sold out, and this was a building that was only supposed to hold 1,000. So as you can tell, I really have a great relationship with the fire marshal. So, <laughs> but we lose to our arch rival, even though we've got standing room only behind each bench. This is just absolutely, you know, berserk. We're electric crowd and we get there we lose and so we have the interviews you know that we filmed afterwards with the head coach and our head coach looks at the camera and says well our crowd you know was too noisy and our players didn't understand it wow so we got t-shirts the next day because we went out and we said quiet please so our team can concentrate <laughs> So, the, you know, we're in the solutions business, right? So, <laughs> realistically, you know, the, the customers came because we found out what they required, which was wants, needs, and desires. There's no difference between anywhere else. You know, if you look about, you know, the single game customer, those people, a lot of ways, are not your fan. They are people that come once. You've got to get them to come several times over. But... You also can't reward them for being a single game buyer. You know, I think we do way too much of this uh, kind of idea that we're going to we're going to give them that promo item that we normally give just to season ticket holders, and that's going to reward them. That's going to make them want to come. Once they see that that you know two points that single distance, that's where they go, and then they say, "Well, you'll reward me with the playoff uh, great seats, the playoff games, if I just show up once." instead of making it clear that you have to show up every time. But realistically, relationships are an interesting thing. Um, this last November, I actually had a lot of emails come my way, complaints about our football playoff tickets. I was kind of surprised because our team wasn't in the playoffs. Legitimate gripe, we're not in the playoffs, but these were actually complaining about playoff tickets. And I looked and I noticed that a lot of these people were from my last school. They had felt enough trust in me to search me out on the internet 
to say, hey, can you fix this problem for me that I'm having at my current school? Okay, it's not my school, but I still went the extra mile because not only do I believe in the product, but if somebody is actually invested in you, you have to understand that you know they matter no matter if you've left that product and you're selling a new one or you know I mean maybe you're out of the business if you have the ability to help them that's all that matters and realistically that requires us to be patient with them be helpful sometimes you know I mean that's that's where you got to work sometimes is patience I know I have to work on it sometimes especially when people want to yammer on for an hour on a keynote and no. <laughs> but you know realistically being helpful and you know providing that insight on how they can achieve their goals through that product that's really what matters but in general let's just face it as I said before times have changed we're not in the 1970s anymore we actually have to sell our product we don't have the ability to say hey, everyone come out tonight and you can come to the game and everyone will just show up because I don't think that happens either. I don't really know that I believe in the walk-up crowd theory, but, you know, really that means that you're selling at all times. You know, frankly, it's uh, that year-round sales cycle, especially for colleges. I know colleges are trying to get into this mode right now and it's difficult for them because a lot of times they've never really had to sell before They've been able to meet budgets, and a lot of the administrators who are above at the top levels have never really had to embrace that. That's why all of a sudden you're seeing CEOs start to take over Michigan and a lot of other athletic departments because they're the only ones that understand you actually have to sell in order to gain revenue. Before it was, we just cover our base, and what we sell, we sell, and if we grow our product, that's enough. That's not enough. We can't just rely on renewals. But realistically i'm i'm saying that i hope that we're an adapt or die stage i know that sounds a little crucial but we really have to get there even at the pro level sometimes that 60 percent capacity just does not cut it and also even if you're at 80 percent capacity but only 60 percent of your people are showing up that's not good either you've got to make sure that you're actually getting people to show up consistently or move their tickets on to somebody who are consistently trying to show up because if you're not nobody's experiencing the product or experiencing the product in the right way you know we can talk about discounting all we want but realistically that's not going to help your per caps you're still losing out on a, a large amount of what you do frankly by trying to discount or try to achieve something to push people into really an environment that they're only going to accept once it's free so when I returned to EWU in 2008, I was an alumnus there, I was excited, and then I found out really what thorns they had there. They only had about 200 season ticket holders for their premier product, which is football. They had over 5,000 tickets that they were essentially giving away every single game. They give it away through some scheme, like you donate 100 bucks and you get $7,000 worth of ticket benefits but realistically, it comes down to the same thing of whether or not, you know, people actually believed in their product. One guy had 20 tickets and he gave $200. Well, that's great. But now somebody sitting, one person sitting there with 19 empty seats and everyone goes, well, nobody comes. Well, you also don't have those seats to sell them. So really, when somebody would tell me, well, there's always tickets floating around, the first thing I'd say is, well, we're stopping that. And a lot of people will say, well... That's not fair. That's not how we do it. And no, we encourage our fans to not believe in conditional love. Let me ask you this. If, if your parents ever told you that I'll only love you if, how would you feel about that? If your friend said, well, you have to do something for me to care about you, how would you feel about that? Realistically, you wouldn't want to be a part of what they're doing. You wouldn't want to be associated with those people because those people aren't your friends. I'm not saying give up on your parents, but, you know. Um, <laughs> But frankly, if you're going to look at it, you cannot be in a conditional love state with your fans. When you are, you end up costing yourself because your fans only come out when you do the things that they want you to do, which are a lot of times showing you why they're exactly not your fans. Free tickets alone also don't solve the issue. I mean, I could wallpaper this entire hotel with 10,000 free tickets a day and never get anybody to show up. No shows for free tickets. That's in like probably, I'm going to say the 8 to 10% uh, percentile. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out percentages. I have no facts on these because they've never been studied, but I'm like my uncle to where if I say it and it sounds credible, that means it should be. So, yeah, I bet you 67% of the people think. Yeah, well, that's how he phrases everything. But, you know, frankly, I think we need to continue to sell more and avoid the discounts and really respect the price point. One thing I've always found interesting is when you start to do this, you always have people talk about the grandfather clause. The grandfather clause. They were promised all these great things that I've never heard of. There's no documentation on it. Somebody came to them at some point in history, came down from the heavens and told them that they had this right, and they remember that day. But you ever notice that the grandfather clause is always one-sided? It's never like they had to do something. It's just that you were supposed to do something for them. And that comes back to the respect on both sides. If they don't respect your price point, then realistically, you've got to tell them, grandfather died. You know, he's dead. He's in the ground. Now we're starting anew. And that's realistically where we need to go to where we face our problems by saying we don't want to devalue a market. I can give you some simple ways to devalue a market. One of them is don't take it seriously. Don't think that your product's serious. Don't really believe that anybody should actually associate with your product. You know, undercut those that buy your product by giving away to others or discounting to others. Heavy discounts, Groupons will not... By the way, Groupons themselves. Somebody's going to have to explain to me exactly what your benefit is. You get them in the building, but nobody actually tells you who those fans are. You have to rely on those fans to decide to come back a second time after you've already given them a 50% discount after you've only gotten 25% of that revenue off of what that ticket is, and then you're hopeful that they're not just a discount hunter who's just relying on the next time you decide to do an email discount. It sounds kind of, to me, as if they're not really your fans. They're just people that show up when it's convenient to them, and realistically, if you go out of business, they'll tell you that, well, baseball doesn't work in this town, or you did something wrong. That's realistically not your best friend. You know, but I look at how to reward our advanced buyers more. And frankly, it's telling single buyers no when it comes to playoff priority or free uh, promos or gifts of those. You know, it's great to use the silver bullet of, you know, gnomes or, you know, bobbleheads or all these things because they do increase attendance. But ask yourself what they cost you on the next game when you don't have those promotions. How many people are you driving out to that game? You're usually driving them out only because you're basically bribing them into coming for one free gift. And whether or not they show up beyond just grabbing the gift and throwing it on eBay, I mean, it's unclear to me whether or not you've actually generated revenue because you can't even make the excuse that they're coming out experiencing the product and buying again because you haven't tied it to anything. You haven't tied it to a season ticket. You haven't tied it to a mini pack. I, frankly, I look at what the Durham Bulls have done, and I was talking to Mike Burling, you know, uh, probably about this summer when I had him on the podcast, and his, his main point was that, you know, realistically, we've got to get them to invest in our product, so if they get a promo item, they've got to be in it long term. They can't just be in it for the free gift, because once they're in it for the free gift, it really doesn't help. So I guess if I'm going to give you a key message... Here's the key message. I don't want anybody in this room to negotiate with ticket terrorism. Now think about that for a minute. You're allowing somebody to basically violate your best principles of your price point in order to just do what they want. And they're actually terrorizing you and saying that if you, if you don't do this, they're not going to show up. My question is whether or not they're going to show up anyway. I strongly doubt it, seeing as how they've never bought in full time to your price point. Now, all of a sudden, you're giving them a discount, and if you take it away, they've decided that that's not going to work for them. I don't think that's right. But this also matters in how we view our markets. You know, we can't have this I-can't-do-it mentality. Your market may be different in certain aspects, but it's still not different in basic business principles. And that means you're selling your product. You're not giving it away. Your customers are not that different that somehow if you go to L.A., if you go to Phoenix, if you go to Wisconsin, that doesn't mean that the second you discount there, because that's, that's what worked before, is really what's going to work now. 
frankly, when you do all that, all you do is cost yourself and you devalue a market. And once a market's poisoned, you know, realistically, it takes a lot to get back. I'll give you a good example of this, and it's one you wouldn't think of. Phoenix. Now, everyone talks about Vegas being a comp city, but Phoenix is one of the, known as one of the biggest comp cities there is because nobody's actually from Phoenix. They're like L.A. or the Chicago, the snowboards from uh, Canada. But realistically, if you look at it, Phoenix has been giving away tickets like mad. You have spring training that's there. You have every major league baseball, you know, minor league baseball. You have NBA. You have NFL. And for a long time, you even have the Andy show. They were giving away tickets like Matt. And collectively, they all kind of made the decision to curb back on their tickets. And everyone threw up their hands and said, this is horrible. How are we going to do this? Right now, the Phoenix Coyotes have more sales than they've ever had before. And when I talked to the marketing director, I said, well, what was the difference? We curbed our free tickets. We curbed away the ability for you to get into experience an NHL product that is one of the elite products in an environment to where a lot of people are from Canada, so they know the NHL product, they love hockey, and here we're violating their principles by really violating our own. So, you know, frankly, you can also look at things that, you know, your folks do and whether or not they're realistically going to, you know, be willing to do anything. You've got to have that jack of all trades mentality. You know, I had it at EW. I just decided I was going to do stuff. If they needed somebody to captain a fun drive, I'd do it. I was the only office member to captain one. Don't care. I'll call people. We'll do it. Because that has to be the mentality that you do. We actually had a problem of we're FCS and we're not on, you know, uh, television. So I was like, well, we have a watch party. We have a casino that's nearby. We can do it. They have the world's largest big screen, apparently. Yeah, but who's going to run it? Because we don't want to run it. Well, the ticket manager is not, you know, uh, really used during the non-football games that are away. I'll run it. So all of a sudden you start setting it up and you've got a few weeks out and you're doing it. And you start doubting yourself. And this is where doubt kind of is weird towards innovation because it makes it to where you start doubting whether or not people are going to show People are going to be a part of it. And I showed up, and I was, like, so defeated because I was going, wow, okay. The, the guy met me at the door, and he said, great, you're here. And I said, great, nobody's here. And he goes, no, we're sold out. We're sold out to the next bar over. This is phenomenal. Now, all of a sudden, everyone wants to be a part of it. Everyone always wants to be part of the train that's already moving, not the one that's just getting started. But, frankly, you have to be willing to go on that train to start. Otherwise, it's not going to move anywhere. You know, I also did it with the tailgate areas. Uh, we had not really much tailgating before, but the problem they always had was if they did buy into the lot, nobody would sit there and chase them out the night before. That's where I became the junkyard dog, you know, the JYD. I uh, started chasing people out with my car that were trying to sneak in at night. And, you know, uh, frankly, I now have uh, terrorized a lot of students who, you know, are now traumatized because their senior year they tried to sneak in with their cars in the private lots before. But, you know, I, I do what I can to, you know, pretty, pretty much promote trauma when it comes to sneaking into places you shouldn't be in. But, you know, frankly, I don't uh, cater to critics as much as maybe I should sometimes. I think that, you know, you have to find your own voice and whether that's lifelong learning or whatever you want to call it. I just focus on the customer. I say, is that really what the customer wants? And that's where you have to go with it. I think a lot of times we listen to way too many people who are critics, not necessarily fans. I got uh, in trouble uh, in 2010, and trouble is kind of a varied word. Um, EW hosted the Montana game. It's our arch rival, and they would sell out the stadium every single year. And they would sell it out with their fans. And how they'd sell it out with their fans is our administrators didn't believe enough in our fans so they would consign 50 to 60% of the tickets that were available over to their side. So every single year, the biggest event we could possibly have where our fans could experience it, instead we're undercutting them and making sure that somebody else could come in and you know make it their own home stadium. That wasn't something I wanted to be a part of. So I made lim uh, limit restrictions to where you had to buy season tickets before the on-sale date of the single game. Boy, I heard about it forever during the summer, but we had a lot more season tickets sold, 
as well as donors who were buying extra season tickets just for the basis of making sure that their rival fans could not actually come in. So, frankly, this was you know the best way to make our fans actually you know support our product and stop catering to new non fans. I think that's important because it set up a way to make advanced buying important. You cannot have it to where advanced buying is not the, the tantamount to getting the most rewards out of your product. So we sold more season tickets than ever. We had more donors happen. And then all of a sudden, on sale date comes for single game. They flooded the Montana ticket office with complaints. They actually called the NCAA and called the compliance office and called the conference office upset that I had done this because how dare I respect my price point? How dare I respect our fans? But you know what? Even though I'm the only ticket manager probably to actually have a newspaper actually pull and make me the most hated man in Montana, I'm okay with it. I actually know. I actually, I actually looked. I counted. And I won a contest. So I, I'm actually thrilled that I'm the most hated man in Montana. But I still get emails about that from people that are still angry about that even though I've left that two schools ago. That people still email me and still get upset. Let them get upset. They weren't your fans to begin with, but a lot of times they have a lot of energy with nothing better to do, so why not focus on me? That's, you know, I guess that's what I'm here for. But, you know, I think when we look at it, a lot of people that want to get something over on you honestly look at sales as a dirty word. We can't let that happen. That's not what sales are. We're not in the manipulation business. We're not trying to con people. We're trying to allow them to achieve goals through our product. That matters from the standpoint that, frankly, we have to ensure that every single time that we're setting up goals for them, that they're achievable. They're something that can be earned. If you want to spend a family outing, you want a great live experience with your family, this is where you want to come. If you want a VIP client experience, this is where you want to come. If you want to make sure that your company outing has a great office environment because you all click, you want to come here. This is where we go. And if you're not doing that, you're not conveying exactly what your customers are going to get out of your experience. You know, I interviewed over 300 people so far on my podcast. There have never been anybody that has ever said that free tickets was, you know, tantamount to success. So I'm actually supportive of that. They all confirm what I want. So I like that. But I'm also willing to listen. I'm also willing to let them talk. I think that matters. You know, we don't actually listen enough, you know, to our customers when it comes to active listening about what they can actually gain. A lot of times we want to talk over them because we want to sell them. I'd rather we listen a lot more to who our customers are and they'll tell you because humans like to chatter. There's one thing about humans. I mean, listen, you've listened to me probably for 45 minutes. I like to chatter. I'll talk all day long, even if my throat goes out. I'll still, I'll still talk. It'll work. But, you know, frankly, it's been a blast. I, I look at this as I've been to spring training and, you know, never would have thought I'd, you know, do half the things I would have done, gone to Vegas and, you know, met, you know, the Nevada State Athletic Commissioner, which, by the way, is a humbling experience because, you know, you expect with the Nevada State Athletic Commissioner that you're going to get somebody who, you know, is one of those cigar champing fedora guys that you meet in the back rooms and, you know, they look like a mobster. Here it's a guy in a five-person cubicle office who is dealing with multi-billion stuff a year, and he is a state worker, earns less than $60,000. This is humbling to realize that, but, you know, that was something he really loved doing. Of course, now he's left the job because he got a more lucrative job, but, you know, it, it still works out. But realistically, we have to realize we're a special group. There's only like 8,000 of us. I know, I count it. So, you know, frankly, if you look at how elite our group is, we get to have the ability to have fun. Nobody else gets to have fun. Look at people in, like, regular, you know, meeting. If you want to go to a city council meeting and you want to tell people what you do, I guarantee you they'll talk to you over an insurance agent. You know, I guarantee you they'll talk to you over anybody else, somebody that sells aluminum siding. So we get to have fun. I, I think that that matters when you're looking at, you know, people that are really in this business and trying to sell this. We're, we're selling fun. We're not selling something that's boring. So I would ask that you find continual innovation in your daily life. That doesn't mean you have to do 
you know, totally creative things every single day, but try to spice up life and, you know, try to do things that are, you know, different. I don't care if it's going the, a different way on the freeway. You never know how many times, you know, going the different way, you're going to find new corporate sponsors that are sitting there that you never even knew existed because you always went down the same path. You know, and naysayers are fun, especially when that train kind of pulls into that first station and they're sitting there going, wow, I should have been part of that. Yeah, you should have. We're, we're, we're moving on. You you might catch on, but, you know, even if you don't, we're, we're moving on. And I, I think that this comes to stop fearing failure. I really do. I think that, you know, when we look at all the ideas that have come out, let's look at the first season ticket that was ever sold. First mini pack. First group sale. Think about that. Imagine yourself being that person that has to pitch that idea. I guarantee you that when that idea was pitched, there was three or four people that said, you're a moron. There's no way that's going to work. Why would somebody buy the entire season when they can show up one game at a time? Why would somebody buy an entire group outing if they, you know, their company can pay once or twice? They don't have to invest. Why would somebody get a mini pack plan? Why would you do that? Those were all new ideas at one time. We have to continually be creative in how we make ideas that are going to work. Otherwise, we're going to be stagnant. And realistically, where we are right now isn't even to the dire nature to where we're going to be 10 years from now if we don't continue to innovate. So what if they don't buy? Let's just say that. Let's, let's say that you have a product out there or a ticket package that they don't buy. Fine. Learn from it. Regroup. Rethink. Resell. There's got to be something that you can learn from that, something that your customers will tell you, and something that you can change more often and really make more successful. So I would always ask the customer, you know, what chance are you taking on me? So what chance can I take on you? What, how can I make something that you've never experienced before even better? If that means you have to start birthday parties, if that means you have to start Greenpeace Day, I don't know. But change it up. Try something different that makes the customer happy. Because there has to be more than just what we're doing now. And frankly, if, if it's not, we just all need to quit. Because we're already seeing that there are no-show capacity issues that are really coming up. And that needs to change before we all kind of collapse on the idea that, well, we just couldn't sell the product. We can sell the product. We just need to sell it more. So I come back to the relationships. That's what matters. You know, when you build that trust and value in the experience, when you really earn that trust and create that value, that's where you're going to sell more. And I feel sales is that kind of starting point to whether or not we've really developed that relationship that takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't mean that you call somebody once and they're suddenly sold forever. But that also means that after they're sold, that starting point, that means that you reconnect with them. That means that you go after them again, not just to you know, sell them again, but to actually engage them and find out how they're doing, how their first experience went, what we can do to change it, improve it, etc. A lot of times we experience retention through the idea of renewals. And that's where a lot of the problem lies, is we only call them once or twice a year. We should really be engaging them as much as possible. Now I know that there's the idea of email, and the email is convenient, social media is convenient, it's easy to tweet something out, but it can also become lazy marketing and lazy connections. How many emails did you get today? How many Twitter followers did you get today? How many tweets? How many Facebook messages? None of that compares to a phone call, but that doesn't mean that the phone call is the only time that you talk to them. You also have to go during every single event that you hold and make sure that they're a part of you. So this is where we are at the crossroads, and I think that we have a great way to kind of you know, face this together because you're already here. You're already trying to learn more about how to gain revenue through your product and really how to help your customers. You know, we can dynamically ticket price all we want to you know, get the revenues up, inflate them as much as possible, but frankly, that doesn't mean more people are coming because we're dynamically ticket pricing. That really means we're covering the fact that we're having less people come, but we're actually charging them more money in order to be there. To me, that after a while, that's, there's going to become a breaking point with that, and I don't know that that's actually going to benefit the fans if it ever has. So this is why Ticket Forum is important. You know, if you, if you talk about ticket redemption, 
you're really talking about the industry as a whole and what the problem that it faces and realistically how you're going to go forward. Because we need to have bodies that fill seats, not just kill off per, per caps by giving away free tickets that don't show up. And if revenue doesn't matter, there's nothing else. So I want to say thank you for making the choice to come to Ticket Forum. I know I've talked a lot. Uh, I, I mean, but be, please become an innovator in this field. You know, others will kick themselves for not being here. That train's already started to leave. So we're going to keep the train moving. And thank you again for making this probably the future of tickets for the next foreseeable future. I guess I just said future twice. But thank you for doing that once again.